afternoon, everyone. Excuse me for the delay. We are some minutes with the delay of some minutes. But it's a great pleasure to introduce the keynote speech with the title Building a State Observer for the COVID-19 Epidemic at the State of Sao Paulo. And I am here with Professor Ahmed Barari from University of Ontario Institute of Technology from Canada. Good afternoon, Professor Ahmed. We will be together chairing this session. Ah, your, your mic is off. Yes, no, I just said good afternoon and I'm very curious to listen to this interesting topic today. Yeah, we all are. The talk will be delivered by Professor Thiago Martins and Dr. Adriano Pinter. Professor Thiago Martins is an associate professor at the University of Sao Paulo and has a doctorate in engineering also by the University of Sao Paulo. This work deals with the cooperation with CVE, Centro de Vigilância Epidemiológica, or Center for Epidemic Watch, in the construction of a state observer for COVID-19 pandemic in the state of Sao Paulo in the year of 2020. The state observer is a non-linear Monte Carlo estimator that uses data from CVP GRIP database. And Dr. Adriano Pinter is doctor in experimental epidemiology applied to zoonosis by University of Sao Paulo. And currently, he's a researcher at the Center for Endemic Control of the Sao Paulo State Government and advisor for the public health program of the University of Sao Paulo Public Health School. Mm -hmm. As we can see, it's a multidisciplinary talk. Let me call them here. Good afternoon, <clears throat> Professor Thiago Martins, and good afternoon, Dr. Adriano Pinter. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dr. Barari. I'm sorry, I, I'm I actually the one to blame for us for, for, for the lateness of this presentation. So uh, let me get started. Mm -hmm. so, uh, now, let me introduce the, the presentation, give you a bit of context. I'm going to move back and forward between myself and Dr. Pinter, right? Uh, but we, we are going to, to share the presentation here. So uh, let's move back to April 2020, last year when Sao Paulo is being hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic, right? And Sao Paulo, uh, the state has just announced the quarantine in mid-March, right? I, I actually was, I believe it was precisely in the Ides of March. Uh, it was supposed to last only 15 days. <laughs> it's funny to look back at that now, right? And it had already, by April, it had already been renewed once. So what's going on, right? Because non-pharmaceutical measures are highly unpopular. Nobody wants to stay at home. The economic cost is very high, right? Uh, business must stop and uh, the, the economy grinds to a halt on many sectors. So what everybody wants to know uh, is when can we go back? So that's what everybody's asking. That's huge uh, political pressure on the, the government. So... Uh, we must answer this question. And to do that, we must try to observe uh, what's going on with the with COVID-19. How, how far is, being, is it spread already, right? How dangerous it is? Uh, what's the risk once you get infected to actually getting a serious case? Nobody knew that by April. Now we have more data, but by then nobody really knew. Uh, how spread it is there were there were rumors that the the virus was already circulating for a while so there was a few uh, there were a few hypotheses about some of the population already being immune but nobody really knew that and how fast more importantly and this is uh, the focus of this research how fast it is spreading right you are going to find something that's called rt replication number what's the replication number Replication number is the average number of individuals that a single infected individual will uh, infect in turn, 
right? So uh, if RT is equal to three, it means that on average, uh, a single person infected with COVID-19 will infect another three persons. And whenever RT is below one, the virus can no longer survive. So the, the, the epidemic is, is ending. Okay, as it turns out to observe such uh, variables is really, really hard, right? Uh, there is a, a first intuition of taking um, statistics based on tests on symptomatic patients. What's this? A patient starts developing some grippal symptoms. So he goes to a hospital, he gets tested, and then you have a result, right? And then you have a statistic, let's say 10% uh, of the tested patients uh, turned out positive. So we try to use this number to estimate uh, the spread of the, the, of the virus. And many attempted to do so and it does not work. Why is that? Because testing dynamics, they vary in time and space. What's the meaning of that? Uh, testing specific for, for COVID-19, uh, they were very restricted and industry was still answering to this call for tests. So the avail availability of testing uh, was varying in time. Testi tests were becoming more available as time went on and not everyone has equal access to testing infrastructure. There's a paradox there, right? Uh, the more we test by testing symptomatic patients, the worse the epidemic appears because we find more cases, right? Uh, by then, I don't know if anyone recalls, but the state of Minas Gerais, where I happen to be from, it has the best statistics of the whole country in COVID-19 because it made the less testing. Right. So uh, on paper, it appears that the Minas Gerais was the best in, in, in the country, but it was simply not testing. So you not, are not going to find any cases then. Uh, but then uh, if you try to apply universal testing, this is simply not possible. We cannot do that. So what can we do? Well, let's use SUS. Now, earlier today, we, we heard a, a very interesting talk about Sistema Unico de Saúde, which is Brazil, Brazil's public health system. Uh, and it provides something quite extraordinary, universal free health care, right? Uh, yes, uh, many Brazilians are now rolling their eyes saying, okay, listen, uh, there are strong limitations on that. Universal free health care sounds a lot better than it actually is. And I, I'm not going to go into that. Yes, it's true. But one thing is important. You are not going to die on the streets. That's the, the main point, right? Uh, if you have a serious disease, you are at least going to go to a hospital. Someone will talk to you. That's the bare minimum. And that's what we need here. Here's the core hypothesis of our work. If you have a severe case of COVID-19, you have equal access to an ICU bed, right? That's the core hypothesis of this work. And yes, there are several limitations, right? Uh, there is the possibility of the saturation of the public health care system. If there are no longer uh, ICU beds available, then we run into a first come, first serve a policy and then the system collapses. And yes, there can be uh, segments of the population that are so vulnerable that even for them to get to the hospital, it may prove difficult but we are going to work with that hypothesis for now. And from that, we are going to use SARS ICU statistics to try to estimate the state of COVID-19. What is SARS? SARS is a severe acute respiratory syndrome, which is a, a, a particular case. Maybe Adriano can uh, speak about it more, but it's, it's a, a set of symptoms that are strongly related to several uh, respiratory diseases, including COVID-19. So we are going to use that in order to estimate the state of the epidemic. Uh, we have further hypothesis on this work. We can discuss that later. But we are going to presume that COVID-19 severity distribution is uniform in time and across the population. Now, this seems to still hold true, at least till the end of 2020, when the variants become more uh, important, this hypothesis is a bit weak, right? And an infected person has a fixed probability of being sent to an ICU bed, right? This is the, 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 the second hypothesis. So uh, 
I'll handle to Adriano. He'll talk about uh, CVAP grip a little bit. And what's what's that? Okay, thank you, Thiago. Uh, this the model uses as a data bank, as a data set, um, information information system that we have here uh, in the, in the national uh, scenario that we we call CVAP grip. Uh, CVAP, CVAP stands for uh, Surveillance uh, Epidemiological Information System. And GRIP itself, GRIP is, is the name we, we have in Portuguese for the, uh, flu, a flu, flu like disease. And just a matter of curiosity, GRIP stands for, I mean, GRIP is the same root of the word GRIP in English that uh, means like uh, glue or something that is, is attached to, because the disease is attached to the human and uh, it, it get, uh, and uh, the, the sickness, the illness uh, is carries carries along with the human. So this is why uh, the name comes from. I mean, uh, this uh, this data set, this data bank, it was used for the model. Uh, and I will show just two screens uh, that I got from the the, the forms because the forms uh, are very complex, very uh, large. So I, I got some some screenshots from the the most important most important part of the the forms. So this is uh, the, 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 the head of the form, and you can have like here a number. This number is uh, unique for every single uh, case, a human case. And there is also the description uh, uh, what, uh, what is, is called uh, this, the SARS syndrome, I mean the SARS. So uh, there, is, there is must be like a saturation of the O2 below 95%. Or there is like a, a respiratory uh, symptoms uh, that may, may, may be uh, classified as flu-like disease. And in this case of uh, the scenario of uh, COVID-19 outbreak, most of the, the this case must be, I mean, should be classified into uh, COVID or SARS, SARS caused by COVID-19. Next. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Uh, wait. What's ah? No. Oh, okay. Yes. So this is three other fields that are important in the form. So you have like the, uh, the this, I mean, information of the patient, uh, especially this is very important, uh, which municipality it, this patient came from and in which municipality he, is re, uh, this patient is receiving the, the proper, proper health care. And also uh, there is information about the uh, onset of the symptoms. There's a very other very important information. And also information about the, uh, the discharge. I mean, the, 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 the period of the, the data, the date, data of the, the uh, dischargement, because then you can have the period of the this patient was uh, under proper care, health care. And also, if it is a fatality, uh, eventual fatality outcome, so you have like the, the day of the death. So this, this, uh, all this data, all this, this information was important for the model. Okay, next. So the uh, the, the public health can must. I mean, this is a mandatory form. So every municipality must fill fill up these forms for every single uh, human case of the COVID nineteen. So let's talk about the, uh, a little bit about the, the, the epidemiological model itself. So COVID-19 is a very simple uh, model for transmission because they, uh, the COVID-19 do, do not use like other hosts, it's just the human being. And uh, is, is, uh, the, so human beings is a source of infection of the, the virus. The elimination route is the respiratory. So uh, mainly, uh, Maybe dispersion by salivary uh, droplets. I mean, uh, the transmission route is, is airborne, and the infection route is also respiratory. Now, a little bit was talk about this uh, that maybe the virus could linger uh, on like surfaces and the big, at the beginning of the, the outbreak. But it's now now we know that mostly transmission is airborne, and then uh, the virus got. Uh, uh, get to the new human being that we call susceptible, a susceptible host. This is another important information because uh, as, as, as SARS-CoV-2, the, the COVID-19 uh, etiological agent, uh, they, they, this, this agent did not have like a cross-immunity cross with any other virus we had here in Brazil. So uh, we classified the whole population susceptible. So this is a very important information. So the whole population of the state, the, the country, 
uh, were considered susceptible to the virus. We didn't have like a cross immun immunity with all the virus. So, it's, and, so, and some uh, people that had contact with the virus, got the virus, got infected, and then some of them can be turned into a source of infection again, and then feedback the, the whole cycle. Okay, next. So in order to, 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 to modeling the, this, this, uh, the, 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 the change of the virus from the susceptible uh, host into the uh, source of infection, uh, we use the, the model that is a very, one, one very simple models because they, they use this model with four, uh, four uh, compartments is the we call CERIR. I will explain it in the next slide. Next, please. So this SEIR model uh, uses four compartments and uh, the first one is the susceptible population and the, and the beginning of the outbreak. Susceptible population is the whole population, is the, the entire population. Uh, so the, when a when susceptible person got ex exposed to the virus, it turned into exposed and is another compartment and then uh, to infectant and then uh, the, this infectant may or may not uh, had like an overt disease. And then uh, the, the, the infected turned into a recovered that, uh, so this is the four compartments. Next, next please. And then here we have uh, some uh, important fact, factors for on the, the, uh, the model. Uh, Thiago will explain this, this uh, later on better. But uh, we we have here that uh, some uh, some recovered some recovered uh, patients eventually are fatality fatality cases. So also there is this me factor that uh, counts up the the probably uh, fatality outcome of the the, the model the, the epidemic. Oh, another important factor of this model is the 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 capital N is the whole population. And we didn't. Uh, we we assumed that the whole population was stable during the, the course of the infection, the course of the, epi the outbreak, the epidemic, because uh, it was easy to mod modeling. So people that eventually had uh, died or the newborn deliveries, we didn't uh, were taken account because it didn't change the population. Uh, really, it didn't um, uh, mess up. I mean, it didn't uh, change the, the the model itself. So th there is the derivation of the, all these these parameters uh, we can see. So the beta is uh, and the gamma is the more important. Gamma is the, the inverse of the time the people someone infected uh, needs to to get rid of the virus. So if someone uh, infected is uh, uh, got infected with the virus, stays infected like for five days. So gamma is uh, equal to point two because every day. Uh, in the in the, the the time steps are daily, every day uh, point two uh, infected people turn into the recovered, and the better uh, parameter is, is one that Chagos will talk more because it's very important is the how many people uh, susceptible people got got infected when it is exposed to infected people, uh, infected person. Sorry, next. Yeah, uh, sorry, I just wanted to no. highlight a few points because we have a, a few engineers here and you love our differential equations, right? I just want to point two characteristics. Uh, those equations are nonlinear, right? You have nonlinearities here. And if we look at those terms in I and D, we see there's a positive feedback. So the system is highly unstable in the earlier stages of the, 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 the outbreak, right? Let, let me... Go back to Adriano now. Yeah, yes, it's, it's, it's related to the biology of the virus because in the the, the, for the beginning of the, the infection, the whole population are susceptible. So uh, all, all all transmission are very likely to find like a susceptible person. And when the the later in the epidemiological process, the the susceptible uh, is depleted, so this is turns more difficult to to for the feedback go, goes on. So uh, the the model itself is used also to to calculation of the reproductive number. So this is the form we we have, and you you you're gonna see that the the gamma and the, the whole population are stable numbers. So the beta is a, the very important number. Beta uh, represents how many people uh, are infected person can infect every day. So this is this uh, parameter is very important. And uh, you may heard about this R not number during the a lot in the, the, the last year. 
but the R0 is just the elementary number of the disease at the beginning of the onset of the epidemic. So uh, for during the epidemic uh, itself, we use the RT because it's the R during in, in time, during the epidemic. So the RT is more important than R0. And, and RE is the effective, effective number that is calculated just at the end of the epidemic. Next, okay, I guess, oh, the, the last one, the, I mean, this, this is something important. Uh, the, uh, the transmission in the state of Sao Paulo was hierarchical, so uh, each was, uh, the transmission was, uh, once, one city was, it was source of infection for the next city, so, but it's not for, but, but continuously, not in territory, but it's uh, like more economic importance, so sometimes cities uh, like away from three, 300 kilometers were more affected than uh, nearby cities because the, uh, it was an economical hierarchical uh, component for one city to infect it and then the next one. Okay, next. I guess I guess Thiago takes. Yeah, takes yeah. So the, the let's part. let's create uh, for the COVID nineteen a stochastic evolution model, right? Because uh, 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 events are random, particularly in the earlier stages. So from those differential equations here. Uh, we will set, to, set those numbers here as constant, the total population, the sigma, and the gamma, right? And those are the variables, the state variables for our system. I've included beta. So beta, as Adriano said, is very important because once you factor out everything, that is the amount, the, the, the fraction of the population that's already immune, and supposing that the virus itself has a uniform bi biology during the outbreak, that is no um, no significant variances, uh, then uh, no significant variants, then beta is the number that represents the behavior of the population, right? So it's a state variable for us. So what we are going to do, we are going to create three flow variables, X, Y, and Z, and those represent the flow between those populations, S, A, I, and R, right? And they, they, those flow variables at each instant are random from a binomial distribution. I, I'm going to ask uh, to anyone attending, why not Poisson, right? That's a, that's a good question. Maybe you'll answer that later. And beta, beta is a tricky one because beta uh, is subject to changes in the behavior of the population. So we are going to do some guesswork here and write beta in, uh, make a logarithm transform of beta and say that it will change at each step following a uh, uh, Gaussian perturbation, right? It's some guesswork here, but we, we must start from somewhere. And then the observation model for our Bayesian estimator is based on the number of UCI arrivals on, on SARS. Now, this number is going to be modeled again as a binomial distribution of Z, the flow of retired persons, right? A fraction of those omega, this omega represents a fraction of infected that will go to ICU. And another term that represents the basal number of arrivals in ICU once uh, that are non-related to COVID-19. So the second term is the arrivals in ICU for uh, SARS non-related to COVID-19. Now we can observe this because you must just pick uh, statistics from 2019. If you take a look at 2019, we can see how we are uh, the expected uh, number of, of, of arrivals non-related to COVID-19. And you can factor that out. And we have a new problem that is to determine omega, right? What's the probability of an infected individual being sent to the ICU? We must find this number. We haven't found it yet. So let's take a look at, at the problem. Now, uh, for the state observer, we are going to implement a particle filter, which is a known technique for observing nonlinear uh, systems using a, a Bayesian approach, right? We create a sample of probable states for the population, and we try to apply a, 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 a random evolution to this and try to match this to actual observed data and discard particles that do not match observed data. But as it turns out, uh, for sigma, gamma, and even beta zero, we had good enough data uh, already in April 20 in the literature, right? We know, knew reasonable numbers is still with some margins, but uh, good enough numbers. Uh, the problem is still omega, 
right? The system is very sensitive to Omega because think about it. If you think that almost everyone that got COVID will be sent to the ICU, then the statistics of the ICU represent nearly everyone that has COVID. If you only a small fraction, if we presume that only a small fraction will go to the ICU, then we have a factor on this number of ICU arrivals. And you know that the actual number is much greater. So as it turns out, our observer is very sensitive to this parameter here. And we can no longer use international uh, data for that because we are subject to local healthcare policies. What's the probability of someone being sent to the ICU? The policies aren't the same across the whole world. So we have a problem here. And then we have the work done by uh, Soroepi and uh, Sao Paulo City Hall. They both did uh, sort of epidemiological surveys. That is, they took random samples of the population and tried to see how what was the fraction of the population that were, was already exposed to the virus. So this is a crucial work on this. Although they did it on very few regions because it's a very expensive task to do. You must go on the streets. You must knock on doors and take blood samples of people on the streets. It's a very difficult thing to do. But this is the key for our omega because we can on our observe, observer estimate the susceptible fraction ST and we can directly observe in selected regions using SOROEPI, for instance, this number. So by taking SOROEPI and matching with our observer, we're able to reconstruct omega to be about uh, 5%, which is actually much higher than everybody thought back in April. Some people were thinking, okay, but COVID is not that lethal. And we found out that, yes, it's very, very dangerous. You have one in 20 chance, about 20 in 20, of being sent to the ICU if you get it. And then uh, further phases of uh, SOROEPI were being used to, to verify our, our observer, and they track it perfectly. It was amazing. So let's look at the, some results. Uh, here we have uh, our team, Grande São Paulo. We're going to discuss this plot later, right? We have a margin of error, and the yellow line shows the progress of RT. And you have in other regions as well. Now, regions with very uh, few habitants have, have a, a wider margin of error, see? And if regions with a larger number of habitants can get to very narrow margins of error for this observer. Um, so those are the reconstructions of the, the epidemic. I'm going to point a few interesting results. First, uh, the R0 was about 3.7 for nearly all regions, which is coincident to what we've seen in the literature for other places in the world. Uh, one thing that I find fascinating on this is that we have visible, strong, and fast, fast, very fast response to on RT for policy change announcements on large centers, right? Uh, this is the date that the quarantine was announced. Look what happens. Look at what happens. We have a, a sharp drop in the in the RT. And then the Sao Paulo plan is announced. We are going to stop the quarantine. And it starts going up right uh, again. And then Sao Paulo plan is delayed. It starts dropping back again. Uh, I want to talk a bit about the Sao Paulo plan from a control engineer's perspective, right? And look at those actions and those responses. Um, what's the goal? What's the strategy for the Sao Paulo plan? This is something that's not very understood. Uh, the goal is to keep the healthcare system from collapsing, right? This is the most important goal, not necessarily to keep people from getting COVID, but to allow people who got COVID to be treated. And they established five levels, each one of the specific social distance measures. And uh, those levels were adjusted based on ICU bed availability. So what happens is the following. Uh, from a process control perspective, the uncontrollability factor of the system is very high because you have a delay that's about 10 days of an effect to be observed on an ICU bed saturation. And the system is much faster than that. Worse still, decisions are made after an artificial delay. So they waited two weeks before taking a decision, making a decision. So any control engineer that looks at this plot and look at this oscillation here, we immediately say, listen, this is a system on the verge of instability. We must reduce control inputs. Um, as a conclusion, 
Sus uh, is actually even better than you think. It's awesome because you have data. Data is from essential on this, right? We've seen works on uh, related works being done in the United States, and they couldn't do it because they were trying to do reconstruct that from uh, insurance uh, company reports, and they have vastly different policies. They are biased. Um, public behavior uh, seems to be re respond to policy changement announcements, right? And epidemic control is difficult because you must apply changes using variables that are very difficult to observe. Uh, that will be it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Thiago, Dr. Adriano. A very, very interesting presentation where we could see that the change in the policy appeared in the modeling. Let me go, go back also. Professor Ahmed, can you hear us? Yes. You are yes. on live? Yeah, you are on live yeah. now. Sure. Yes. And um, yes. very interesting. You, you, you said that there is available data. I mean, this is something really important. And I, I would, I want to know if this data is still available now, or because I, I heard that somehow data disappeared in some sources. For, for you, for your modeling, the data is still available. This, this is actually a, a very good question. Uh, listen, this data is still available to many researchers. Not myself anymore, since I'm not doing uh, this work here, because it's very sensitive data. You have a very sensitive data, so it's still being collected. Uh, I don't know if Adriano can say further for that, because uh, uh, people at CVA uh, uh, still have this data, right? Uh, not me, and I don't think that Adriano still has it, but he, he, he can say it. More about yeah, it. it's, it's, it's still being collected. So the data bank is there. I mean, they are actually being a, pri a priority is is is, uh, is available. But the policy for the government to for people to have access to this data change a little bit. So uh, we need to, to to go under like a more more more. I mean, it's more difficult to, to get access to the data. But it is there. I mean, the the the, the state still collecting the data. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. once you take a look at the data, you understand why uh, it must be somehow controlled because most of the data is very sensitive. Although I do believe that if we had uh, published those plots that I've shown you to the general population, maybe we could, I have this, this idea that if we could show the instant variations on RT, we could maybe have dumped the behavior, right? We are control engineers here, right? You want to add dampening to the system that's on the verge of instability. So if the population knew that, well, listen, RT is increasing, maybe you want to delay going out today. Don't go, go tomorrow, right? Maybe uh, the if we, we were to publish the processed data with no sensitive information, then perhaps we would have a better behavior, who knows? It's tricky to, to control this system. I, I, uh, every day and night, we hear that the Imperial College has some information, Imperial College. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to know if you know how they do this processing, if they, 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 they have similarity or not, because they are quite far from here. And because you are doing something in some poly state, we know some some specific information, perhaps that you can include there the model. And if they are using the same information to get the result, they are not. They are using those uh, symptomatic patient test statistics. So they are aware of the bias, right? They they do not ignore it. Just, just try to power through adopting some models. And sometimes they get it right, sometimes they get it very wrong, right? If you were to apply uh, the tracking that we did with, uh, the, with the, the, the observation, 
the sorrow epi because there there were several phases. They are actually now on the their sixth phase, right? <coughs> the imperial data do not track with those actual surveys. It's very different. While ours matches nearly perfectly. So why this is happening? Because we are much smarter than them, right? No, it's because uh, we we have access to this data. The CVAP grid was crucial to the observation. They can't. They uh, they are using uh, symptomatic patient uh, testing statistics, and they are very biased. And they try to to model those biases, but it's very difficult to observe everything. Yeah, the graph that showed us uh, with the. the the synchronism with the announcement of the quarantine, it was, it was really, really amazing. I mean, it's it's quite scary, actually. Yeah. I've been discussing with colleagues that work in administ public administration. Say, listen, and that's very interesting. Here's actually uh, I can't see it clearly here, but this is the day that the quarantine was announced. But the actual implementation was one week later here. So the population answered to the announcement, but not to the actual implementation. When the government and the governor went to the press and said, you are going to have a quarantine starting next week, immediately RT starts decreasing. Mm -hmm. Even before the quarantine was effectively effective. Mm -hmm. that's, that's something that surprised me. It matches the announcements more than actual policy implementation. Interesting. Uh, I, um, I, if I ask uh, a question, it can be about the uh, the nature of the um, data. Like just right now, um, uh, we hear a lot of uh, uh, news that like this a specific uh, virus works on a group of people better or stronger. Like just some uh, kids uh, or younger people can survive better. Uh, older people are more um, in danger. Also, you see people that have some precondition like diabetes or blood pressure. They have a certain uh, sensitivities to the virus. So like these uh, right now, as far as I understand, you deal with uh, with the whole population totally uh, as just a random sampling process in a, a Bayesian approach and you don't look at these factors that produce some biasness in the analysis right so um, I'd like to know uh, how we can in, in how you can consider these aspects there and maybe even use like right now the method that you have is, is great to help the government in developing policies or just making the decision predict the future public policies for the next announcements or this and that uh, considering resources but if you look at the certain factors as i mentioned like the age or precondition and so on maybe it can even help the treatment process or just the uh, actual uh, way to uh, deal with the patients, correct? Well, uh, per perhaps I can include in your question, uh, Professor Ahmed, something about the distribution that I remember that Professor Chargo was going to say something, but I think just forgot to say and explain. That's, that's actually a very good point. Uh, concerning our model, uh we are segmenting into regions right we're supposing that the contact among people from same region is more important than contact between people from different regions uh so uh this aspect of heterogeneity in the population is is real but our hypothesis is that those heterogeneities were equally dispersed in the state that is uh, every region in the state has about the same age distribution and the same success sensitivity distribution. So everything averaged to a single mix, right? Which is a, a simplification. I'm aware of very uh, interesting works 
that try to segment people as susceptivity and say, listen, children are more in contact with children and grown-ups are more in contact with grown-ups and try to establish some sort of matrix of relationships between people of different groups. The issue is that those are made. This is a lot of variables to observe. And, mm. and so they are limited to that. I don't know if Adriano can add something to that. No, exactly. Because if you could, if you want to put into the models like these very, these variables uh, amongst the population, with more or less susceptible people, it will be like a, a turn into this model in a huge stuff. I mean, huge thing. that will be more more difficult to 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 run. But uh, we know that actually, uh, in I mean, uh, uh, the the COVID nineteen spread is more like we done we we through we call super spreaders. So you know that. Some few people are more uh, more capable to spread the virus than the most of the people. So this is why I think uh, Chavo said something about that uh, the poison uh, distribution would be more like uh, a better a better guess for the the, the, the model because yeah. this is how the disease is spread. But yeah, true, true. The, the 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 binomial is just a numeric trick because you have cases yeah. with very small number in the earlier stage. You have like ten persons that are infected. I can't use the poison distribution for that. So when we are in the uh, the thousands of infected, then yes, poison is easier, is better. But we've used a binomial just to go through those very early stages where you have three, four, five. That's why. But uh, something we can use the the part. I mean, the demographic data about the popul for the population it can be used for the outcome. So we know, for example, that uh, we have like a. Uh, younger population than, for, for example, Italy. Italy has like an older population. So mm. when you compare to the data from the Italy, uh, we know that we had like a, a younger population. So probably we had like less pers less people uh, with like a very a more more complicated, more uh, severe case of the disease. So we, we we could use this for the outcome because the model uh, also can predict the outcome. I mean. Uh, how many fatalities we would expect uh, from the, the the whole for from the whole epidemic? So this this uh, we didn't show that, but this is something uh, I could say that is very interesting because the the, the term, deterministic model uh, predicted something for the state of São Paulo something about 400 fatalities, 400,000 fatalities, and now mm -hmm. we we now have like 150 thousand fatalities. So it's a it's a third. Of the way of the what was expected uh, by the deterministic, mm -hmm. deterministic model. So probably what the, what the model uh, Chago created shows that uh, that the, in fact uh, the non pharmacological measures that the state of São Paulo take was took at the moment was important to reduce the fatalities to one the one third that was supposed to be without the without any measure. Now, listen, this is very important, what Adriano said, and whoever says that no pharmaceutical measures had no effect must answer why is this curve behaving like that, right? Why, uh, uh, why uh, drop then? It's, it's obvious that uh, once the quarantine is in place, the replication number, it, it decreases. So mm. the, 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 this is no longer a, a, a matter of speculation. We have the, the actual results here. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to ask also uh, some implementation detail, perhaps, how long it, it takes to, to make the calculation? Because the this is probabilistic. Yes, yes. Mm. yes. The, the, the particle filter is infamously slow. But then again, uh, I mean, to process everything, uh, it takes about uh, eight hours, something like that. But it's not for, for the São Paulo state. Yes, for the whole state, it takes about eight hours, right? Uh, it's heavy, but it, it's highly parallel. Uh, I mean, it takes it takes eight hours on a desktop computer, right? I could mm -hmm. uh, spread on a cluster and have the same result within an hour, but it's enough because I have data coming only once per day, so mm -hmm. it's fine. It's enough. Mm -hmm. Um, that's it. Can I just point how gorgeous Mot Matplotlib has gotten? Th those plots are, are, are just beautiful. And that's all Matplotlib. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's 
very very good i, I was pleasantly surprised I, I have been away from that and interesting so um this um uh, assumption that you have about the uh, distribution of the um demographic um, of people like just the different ages and combinations that works very well and your model eventually is so sensitive to to the to just demonstrate its reliability yes. so as the yeah as the next stage do you think um, you can uh, even consider uh, certain factors and just produce different remedies for each group of people or each uh, I just I can even I can think about the environment that people are living in their uh, age uh, their preconditions correct and and this way even you can go for some detailed policies of individual groups like for high school students what is the new policy or just for the, uh, the smaller yeah. I think I'm going to, to, to refer to Adriano on that. I'm just going to point out for the model. If you were to increase its complexity right now, it would be to accommodate the variants and the vaccines. Because the variants and the vaccines, both those change completely. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Even the, one. sorry for the interrupting, Tiano. Even for uh, treatment, because you have a factor about the recovery, but not all the patients are treated the same way. They just some are... Some of the medications are different. Uh, each doctor has his own style to treat the patient, correct? And if I can include another point is that we can read in the newspapers and that this gamma variant, a delta variant, is increasing mainly in Sao Paulo state. I mean, they, they are saying that we are opening too early and because of some simulations that they are performing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to include in your answer, if you know how they are doing this and if they are telling the truth, just for us to, to understand a little more. Uh, that's true, Adriana, true answer. I, I just run the numbers. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess what, what does, I mean, the, in the model we showed that what the vaccines do is taking people from susceptible group, it take, directly to the recovery group in some way in the model. And they, what the, the, the different variants, the different strains of the virus do is the opposite. It's taking people from the recovery and bring it back to the susceptible group. So mm. maybe it's, it's not that difficult to, to put this, this, uh, this, these factors inside the, the model uh, Thiago Chong because, showed. Because uh, it's, it's, it's a matter of taking population from the one side to another side. Uh, but but when we have this variant, they are saying that uh, even an infected uh, patient can get if he, it's cured, he can get a second. Yes, yes. Infection. This is why. Yes, exactly. This is why we're taking people from the recovered group and getting taking uh, taking I mean putting back in the susceptible group. So we we increasing because uh, the whole model, when it goes step by every step of the model is, is taking, is depleted people from the susceptible group into the recovered. And it's not supposed to go back because it is a one way model because uh, actually uh, a recovered person shouldn't be back into the, the susceptible group again. But when you have like a new strain, a new variant, this is what happened. So actually is the model going back and start, start again as, as, as a new outcome, as a new, I mean, it's a new outbreak. So when we have like a new, a new strain, it's, 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 it's like a, it was a new outbreak started again. So we model, I guess that the, the model can, can uh, hold, help this, hold this. Mm -hmm. And another other thing is important. I mean, this is a model make, uh, designed for like an airborne disease that it could be used for a, any other uh, airborne disease. We could use it like for uh, regular flu or measles or any other disease that uh, can be transmitted airborne. So it, it may be used for in the, the future for, uh, for the next outbreaks also. Mm -hmm. yeah. Concerning the variants, uh, if I may add, uh, the tricky part is to, that the variants, they add 
new um, new variables here, right? We have new new sets and, and we have combinations of people that are susceptible to a single variant but not susceptible to other ones. So uh, the number of variables to observe uh, is increases and we perhaps must adjust our sort of epidemiological surveys to to correct for specific to look for specific variants in order to to observe that um, concerning the policies uh, i must say that we haven't changed anything on the policy yet we're still following the same idea of preserving and that's something that's often misunderstood Right, we are trying to pres preserve the health care system. Mm -hmm. If w while there's uh, plenty of ICU beds available, uh, there will be no restrictions. Why is that? Because uh, there, that's not the, 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 the goal is to preserve the health care system. There was a debate uh, comparing Sao Paulo's strategy with the Swedish strategy, right? Because they say, well, listen, Swe Swe the, the Swedish strategy is to let everything open. In fact, we have the very same strategy. We are doing exactly the same thing. The difference, the key difference is that the Swedish uh, healthcare system had a wider margin. So they only mm. started applying restrictions in late 2020. But the core strategy is exactly the same here and there. So uh, it's often misunderstood by the population. They, they have uh, several colors, five colors, right? And the green was the, 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 the le least restricted one. And people would look at green and say, listen, we're safe. And I was saying, no, healthcare system is safe, not you. It just mm -hmm. means that you have an ICU bed, perhaps for you to die on, if I may be so drastic. But the healthcare mm -hmm. system is safe not the person because that's not the main goal mm -hmm. so yeah uh, there are variants but we still have uh, plenty of ICU beds available I don't think uh, restrictions are going back yet mm -hmm. but the problem is as control engineers we know right that the, if there's a delay between cause and effect and we take too long to observe and longer still to act upon it then the system becomes unstable in fact, that's what we're seeing here. Any control engineer who would look at this plot and say, listen, you're on the verge of instability here. You are almost unstable. It's, it's obvious. Forget that this is an ep epidemic. Let's suppose you are trying to control the position of a servo mechanism. You look at this plot and say, this is unstable. And that's actually what it is. I guess, I guess it's how uh, the system would realize that a new strain is circulating in the, in the population now. Because it, uh, I, I, the introduction of a new strain, a new variant of the, the COVID, I mean, SARS-CoV in the population, will lead to uh, instability again of the system. So the system could, could realize mm -hmm. this uh, early, that, it, probably early that the, the, the healthcare uh, surveillance, uh, regular healthcare surveillance. Yes, yes. I mean, we're going to, to discuss probably public administration here, right? I'm saying that the system is not being properly controlled, but they are operating within constraints. Now, how, how do you say to everyone, listen, try to go 5% less outside than yesterday. That's just not possible. We can't communicate that properly, right? So they must use those five different levels. They are very different. So we have a, 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 an action that's perhaps a, a too, too harsh and you take too long, but when you're operating within the constraints of public administration and, and communication, I don't know how to do it better, right? When I say that's not being properly controlled, uh, yes, but how can we do better? I'm not sure. I have this intuition that perhaps by communicating this sort of plot daily to the population, we would have a better result, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I need to, to thank again Professor Thiago and Dr. Adriano, but we have a section that we start in 14, 15. Oh, yeah, and I'm chairman. I'm on those this sections. is really interesting topic and very actual. Um, and thank you for accepting and delivering this talk to us. Thank you very much.
Thank you. I thank you very much for the opportunity to talk. Thank you. you. It was a great uh, presentation. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop the, the streaming.